So here's kind of a quick checklist that I like to think of um, when evaluating open source projects. We need to evaluate the basic health, right? We need to know, is it an active project, right? Uh, check the governance. Is, is there defined governance? Uh, review maintenance and releases. Is there a you know, predictable cadence? Um, and community, and then, of course, bug reporting. And I'll go into more detail. So here's a question. What is the first thing that you would look at when evaluating an open source project? Does anyone want to volunteer? In the black hoodie. Yes. Yes, you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. The first thing I look for is, uh, um, have they had CVEs at all? Okay. Um, I, this almost builds on your question earlier, but uh, a small enough project that hasn't had any means that there just hasn't been enough eyeballs to find them. That's fair. Um, okay. And if they have had CVEs, um, that naturally leads into um, what, what is their published process for reporting um, bugs, uh, security vulnerabilities, and uh, can I actually trace, did they fix it in secret or did they fix it sort of in the open? And what did that process look like? What was time to resolution and actually mm -hmm. uh, uh, a patch release for? I love all of that. Those are great. Who else wants to talk about it? I think Kyle has some good stuff. I, I want to hear from Kyle. I mean, really, the, honestly, the first thing that I look for is the date of the last commits. So, okay. Because there's like a that. lot of abandoned projects. And so, the, you know, if, if you're go going to include something and depend on it in the future, you kind of want to know that there's someone still working on that project. And security or not, if someone's not actively developing the project, they're also not going to actively fix a security vulnerability that might be found in it later on. Yeah, I like that. Uh, let's, get, let's get one more. Who else wants to add one? Uh, in the hat, I think it says, in, uh, yeah, something I can't read. I'm old. Apologies. <laughs> I always look for something that's active in the number of contributors for open source software and okay. the commit as well. Because when was the last time the code was committed? If it's not even an active project, with, you know, I wouldn't even look at, regardless of the CVE or whatever, if it's not active, I don't even bother. Cool. Thanks. All of those are fantastic, right? These are all things we probably should look at. But um, how about this one? Is it even maintained at all? Does it have a maintainer? <laughs> <laughs> I found this one. Uh, there you go. Yeah, looking for a maintainer. That is a pretty big red flag, right? Um, so, so there are some other ones, right? Is it maintained? When was the last commit? We heard that one. Look at this project. Ten years ago. Probably a bad sign that you, you know, this is not a well-maintained and healthy project. Uh, <laughs> and then another thing. Again, we we talk, We just mentioned this. Look at the issue queue. See what's going on in there. Um, you know, our our. Are people interacting? And this one, eh, not so many. This is the same project that we saw in the previous. But yeah, so these are all red flags, but just basic stuff, right? Is, is there a maintainer? Are people, are people active? When was the last post? When was the last issue posted? That's an indication that people may or may not be using the project, right? Um, and then when was the last response to an issue? If an issue is posted, are, are there maintainers responding, or is anybody in the community responding? Um, and let's talk about governance. Uh, people don't necessarily always think about governance when you think about security. But all of these things are an indicator of the health of a project. And a well-cared-for project, I think, tends to be a more secure and stable project. And so what is governance, right? Um, rules, customs, processes, it's an indication of maturity. So this is the o list of OSA licenses we're scrolling through here. Um, obviously, you know, when, when you're using open source, you want a clearly, uh, clearly stated license. And hopefully it's, it's OSI approved. Um, you, want, uh, you want to see that there are multiple maintainers. And then also, hopefully, a mature project is really going to have maintainers from more than one organization. Um, you know, when projects first get, start, uh, get started and, and are kind of picking up steam, you'll, you'll maybe see you know, all of the maintainers are from one company. And that's, you know, that's something that's maybe OK, but it's definitely something to consider when you're evaluating projects. And then how are decisions made? Is there a clearly defined process even for, for uh, merging pull requests or any of that stuff? So you want to check out documentation. Um, the other thing I want to look at is the, the release management. Is there, a, is there a release cadence, right? Um, has there been releases in the last year? And are they on a predictable cadence? Is it documented? Is the release process itself documented? 
Um, is it regularly recur occurring? Do you know that there's going to be a uh, point release every six months or they are on top of patch releases? Does the project communicate regularly? This is one of my favorites. I like to see that a project has a blog and is actually communicating with users. I think that's a great indication. And all of these things, oddly enough, do come back to security. Is the latest release an alpha? Maybe, maybe think twice about that one, right? Um, then we, you want to also see, so that's you know, governance and release. Then we talk about community engagement, and that's the, those are the people that are using the project. Are the people using the project contributing? Is there a contributor guide? Great sign, right? You want some basic information about how to contribute to the project because you do want to build a community because a, support, a, a project supported by a community is going to be a more stable and therefore secure project. Is it extensively used? Um, you know, a lot of stars, a lot of forks, a lot of that kind of stuff. That's, that's a good sign. Is the security, can you tell that the community is working toward security best practices? All of these things hopefully can be found in some documentation. Are they, make, are they writing automated tests? Is, is the community working towards keeping dependencies up to date? Or are you going to dig in there and find something that's several years old, not secure, not supported, not getting updates? Um, here's, I just, you know, I'm a long time Drupal nerd, so this to me is a great example of a very mature project that outlines its um, contribution really, really well. No matter what it is that you might want to do, if you want to contribute documentation, if you want to contribute to the accessibility efforts, if you want to contribute to the core or contributed modules, it's all very well defined. And this is, again, a fantastic sign of a healthy community. I record everything, by the way, because I don't trust uh, live demos. So <laughs> I hope the scrolling is OK. Yeah, it gets a little nutty. OK, we'll go. We'll keep going. Um, so here's another thing that I want us to look at. And that's, does the project have a process for securely reporting bugs, right? We don't necessarily want a security researcher or somebody out there finding like, oh, here's a problem. Let's just post it to the issue queue, right? So this is an example from WordPress, obviously a very mature project uh, with very clearly uh, outlined processes. This one, I believe, oh, that's Kubernetes, right? Mature project, great documentation, great example. Um, this is, I believe, oh, which one is this? I think that's, oh, that's GIMP. There we go. GIMP users, any GIMP users? So GIMP is following the rules, right? Or <laughs> the best practices. And this is Mastodon. Short and sweet, but it's still there. So again, you want to see something. There's no necessary, it doesn't have to be extensive necessarily. There's not necessarily one single right way to do this, but you want to see something. Um, so now that we've, we've kind of established like what, what makes a project healthy, Right, let's go a little bit deeper. Um, I'm going to show you a, a few security tools that we have for evaluation. So there's, I'll show you in a sec, one called uh, CVE bin tool that I hope uh, every people might check out. That's Intel maintained. Got to put a plug in for that. But then I'd like to talk to a little bit about the Open Source Security Foundation. And that's something I'm a bit involved in. I am actually the co-chair right now of the uh, marketing group and therefore also the developer, the DevRel community. So that's something out there spreading the word. So, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So we have a couple of projects, the OpenSSF Best Pro Practices Badge, which is a very quick and easy uh, thing to look for, and then a tool called um, OpenSSF Scorecard. And then we're gonna, I'm going to show you a little bit about a project that actually Microsoft donated called S2C2F, the Secure Supply Chain Consumption Framework. It's a great reference material. So the first one, uh, CVE Ben Tool. So first, I have to talk about the lovely group of people who maintains this project. It's led by a woman named Terry Oda. And she also uh, recruits, she gets a little help from Google Summer of Code occasionally. So it's a very, very much a community supported project. It's very simple. It, it, what it does, it's a binary scanner. It helps you just determine which uh, packages may have been included in a piece of software. Uh, 290 checkers, uh, they focus on uh, components like OpenSSL, that kind of thing. Uh, and then it, they have tools for scanning in various formats. It can scan a CSV file. Um, it can scan uh, language specific package scanners and several uh, software bill of materials formats. 
Um, again, I don't really go into SBonds too much here, but, but that is a, basically just a list of all of the components that's in your software. So the, what CVE bin tool does then is provide a very easy way to analyze it, and it can be as simple as what you see here, just install it and run it on the command line, scan a folder, and then you know, it gives you some really great and useful information. So thank you, Terry, Oda, and team. And here's the, uh, the next part. So uh, the next few tools I'm going to talk about are from the OpenSSF, and that's the organization that I mentioned before. Um, it is part of the Linux Foundation. It is a group of people from many uh, big companies, big and small, that have come together to improve the open source software supply chain, basically. And to that end, uh, there are several tools, and the ones that are really more geared toward consuming uh, are the ones that I'll talk about. Again, I just wanted to kind of show an overview of all of the different activities that the OpenSSF is involved in, because there are many, and it's a fantastic organization to get involved in. But we're really only going to focus on some of the things that I think they're in the best practices section. So you can see that there's so much going on. And what, what this really means is that there are a lot of people who care about this stuff, right? They care to fix what are perceived problems in the open source ecosystem as you know, they relate to security. So there are a lot of people have come together to try and come up with various different solutions. And, and um, so I think that's, that's the optimism. You know, a lot of security, security talks and a lot of security topics can be a little bit doom and gloomy, right? Oh, we have all these problems and, you know. But this is the optimistic section where there's a lot of people coming together to fix them. So the first project I wanted to mention um, is the OpenSSF Best Practices Badge. Um, again, you know, security is never something that is over or done, but it's a process. So you can er a project can earn this best practices badge and, and attach it. You'll just see it like on the left um, on a project page for, for those projects that have used it. It's not that widely used yet, but it, there are several hundred projects, I believe, using it. And you can look, at, you can look up uh, on the website. And all of these, by the way, will be available later to easily uh, get to. But you can look up on the uh, OpenSSF best practices website to, to, to look at individual projects. So even again, you're not, you don't necessarily have to look at this uh, from a dependency perspective, just as an end user of something like LibreOffice. You can see that they earn the best practices badge, and that's great. Um, there are also varying levels of best practices and that is, there's merely passing, then there's silver and gold. So what that means is that if you, if you drill down, you can see that, so they've met some of the, they've met the basic requirements, but there are things that they, that they could do to go a little bit further. And all of this, again, you can find on that uh, best practices site. So the next project that I really want to dig into is OpenSSF Scorecard. I'm uh, pretty enthusiastic about it. We use it at Intel. Um, it's... I think quick and easy, uh, opinions may differ on that, but to me it's quick and easy, right? It, again, it can be as simple as a command line uh, re scanning a single project, and it can also be integrated in GitHub Actions. But what does it do, right? It, it helps protect us from some things. It automates some of the process of checking for all of the things and on an ongoing basis, right? So we, we don't have to manually go in and look at issue queues and count maintainers every, you know, every so often. So, so let's get into that. Um, OpenSSF scorecard, again, you can run it on the command line or actually it's the, the, the scorecard project main, uh, maintains scans of a certain number of projects already and you can actually find those on, uh, through the web interface. So that's quite handy. Um, the other project I do wanted to mention is the uh, Secure Supply Chain Consumption Framework. Again, I, this is it's geared toward possibly um, enterprise level, really, but I think at all of the various tiers and levels of compliance with this, these best practices, there's a lot of really va uh, valuable information. It is a framework. It's basically a document. I link to it at the end. I would encourage everybody to just go check it out. It links to, again, many, many free, tool, free security tools that are free for open source projects. So it's a pr really just a great reference. Um, so now, now that we've, we've gone through all of that, let's actually evaluate some software. Um, so again, recap. We've, we've talked about things like reviewing basic health, right? You just do a little quick gut check. Is it active? A quick gut check on its, on its governance. Is it, it, the governance even defined? 
Um, and then we've looked at review, we will review uh, maintenance room releases, see the cadence, we'll check out the community. Um, and then we want to see that, that documented bug reporting process. But then after we've done all that, we can also run S open SSF scorecard. So what I've done here, let's just, we're grabbing a random repo, right? There's a kind of nifty tool that will throw out a random repo, and we found one. It looks pretty promising. Um, here's its GitHub page, right? We, we see that it's used by quite a lot of people, has a solid number of contributors. It has a, a nice little bit piece of uh, documentation there. It does not have an open SSF best practices badge, but we'll forgive them. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll continue to dig deeper. We don't have that easy check, but, but you know, again, people are still working on adopting that. So we, we look at the issue queue, right? It looks pretty solid. You know, it's, um, I can't see from here. When was last? <laughs> There's some activity, right? There, there is some activity for sure. Pull requests. There are a solid number. Many have been closed, right? You see, I don't know if you can, if the screen is bright enough to see, but um, you definitely see that there's activity there. Are many comments on several of them. Several of them have been closed. All of these are, you know, it's looking okay, right? So when we go to run Open SSF Scorecard, it's again you install it, and it's as simple as running a command like this. So we'll just quickly do that. And what it's going to do is it's going to go through a checklist, basically, of various criteria. And each of those is given a weight. This is what the, 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 the uh, terminal interface looks like. But I'm going to quickly switch over to the web interface because I think you can see it a little bit better. So, so OK, we've done, our, we've done our OpenSSF scorecard scan. So what do we see here? We see a score of 5.5. What do, what do we think? Is that, is that a good score? I don't know. I mean, it's showing up as yellow. So can, can you read the, 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 the various criteria very well? At the top on the left, you see, you see the most critical. So each one of these is given a weight, right? So, so these are the, the, basically the order in which you, can, you should consider the importance of these various checks. Um, and, and it gets a perfect 10 on, on dangerous workflows, right, which is the most critical. So that's a good sign, I think. Um, but then you see branch protection. It gets a zero. Well, that's kind of concerning because that's a pretty simple thing to fix. But that's also the good news, right? Is that if someone were to, one were to flag the maintainers, they could easily fix this one and boost their score. Um, again, token permissions, it's, a, it's again a high priority item and it's something that, that gets a very low score. So that's an indication that their tokens aren't configured correctly and there is some uh, vulnerability there. There is an opportunity um, for something to go wrong. And then code review, that's another, that's kind of a red flag too, is that they, the, the, the automated check has determined that the code review has not, uh, is not quite up to snuff and that the, the processes could be improved. So again, a red flag and something, and this does not mean don't use this, this project. What this means is that these are areas, I think, where you want to dig a little deeper. You want to go see for yourself, okay, what are the code review practices? What could be done? differently here. Maybe you do want to flag for a maintainer, hey, this score is a little low, something you want to look into. Um, but again, it has some really great things too, right? Um, some, some perfect tens. And then you see, I, I want to draw attention a little bit. Um, so you don't, it's not doing something like fuzzing, but that's only a, meeting, a medium priority item. Um, and a lot of projects, I think, don't do fuzzing. Um, in case anybody, anybody not know what fuzzing is? Totally feel free to raise your hand. Anybody do, yes, know what fuzzing is? Okay, cool, we don't have to go into that too much. Um, so if you notice on the bottom, packaging and uh, signed releases, you see a question mark. That's a little bit confusing, but what that means is that uh, some projects don't actually have, they don't necessarily package releases in, in the way that, that scorecard scans them, right? So a little bit of a UI confusion there, but um, but that's just, again, something you want to go and verify manually. Like, okay, so what, what, what is the reason for this uh, ambiguous score? So um, here's another project, again, evaluated by OpenSSF Scorecard. I wanted to show you this one because it's a higher score. <laughs> and so there's an example. There are examples all over GitHub of, of projects that will have various scores. You'll see lower ones. You'll see higher ones. Uh, you know, here you see the, some good things, right? No dangerous workflows. It's definitely maintained. 
There's a security policy. They're even doing fuzzing. Cool stuff, right? Less good. No, again, no signed releases. Uh, static analysis. That's pretty low-hanging fruit, right? If they're not doing it properly. Yes, Kyle. Yes, thank you for, for that. Yeah, so in each case, you can drop down on the web interface, and even in the terminal, um, you have a link to the documentation explaining the result and explaining resources for fixing it. Thank you for asking that. I should have mentioned it. Um, but yeah, so again, this is a, you know, a higher score. Um, still, again, some things to look into, but overall, looking pretty good. So, you know, we, we've just looked at, at some community efforts, and, and this is the part where I want to <laughs> plug that ultimately, uh, again, as I, as I said when I started, thank you for all being here because you care about open source security. So the best way to put that into, uh, into action, I think, is, is to join community efforts. Like, it doesn't have to be the OpenSSF. There are a lot other uh, security communities out there, but OpenSSF is an, an example of one. Um, get involved. You know, again, when you're when you're evaluating projects, it's 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 the same as with documentation, right? When you see when you run into a problem doing something, the best thing you could possibly do is write some documentation and contribute that back to the project. It's the same with security. Um, when you when you find something that's maybe not as great as it should be, you know, open a pull request, get in touch with the maintainers, you know, jump in. And the same goes to uh, community efforts. Jump into organizations, join a working group. Uh, sit in on a working group, learn from them. You know, it's, it's, you know, I can't recommend it highly enough um, because, again, the, the best way to, make, to influence the future of these open source security best practices is to join, join the fun yourself. And this is uh, kind of where I, I wrap up slightly, but that is <laughs> maybe the most controversial part of this, uh, this talk is really understanding that when we're consuming open source software, whether that means we are including uh, dependencies in our own projects or if we are using GIMP, the developers on an individual basis don't really owe us anything. It's kind of us to take, op uh, to take ownership of those projects. And that means contributing back. That means uh, taking the time to evaluate, as we just looked at. That means, that means also, um, again, contributing to establishing things like uh, best practices. And I think, I think it's important to remember, you know, not just that this benefits all of us as users and consumers of open source software, but it helps the entire open source uh, ecosystem, right? Um, really quickly, does anybody have any questions that we, where I can dig into a few of these other things that I talked about? Yes. Hi, I'm just curious about the one that, that you mentioned in the previous slide. You talked about the code review. The score was low. It was. How did the open SSF um, Let's go back. find out about the code review? Is that, are you talking about a manual process? Because the code review could be a human code review. How would you figure it out? Or is it through the documentation? Or are they using like smart bear? Or, I'm just curious, how did you is come up question. with that score? Actually, yes, Ryan, I would love for you. Ryan, so if we could bring the microphone to Ryan, who sits in the, he actually contributes to open source scorecard and would give you a better uh, answer than I will, but I will also pull it up and show you how you can dig into it yourself. Essentially what uh, scorecard is doing is it checks all of the pull requests that were accepted over the last 90 days. And in that particular case, it gives it a six because only about 60% of the accepted pull requests went through code review. So it's so, doing oh. that uh, uh, programmatically, not, not based upon documentation or anything go. like that. Um, and by the way, uh, uh, just Oops. to, to um, address Kyle's comment earlier, uh, uh, if you're running scorecard by hand and you're curious why it gave you a specific score, you can ash, uh, add uh, dash dash uh, show dash details, and it will show you the exact reason why it's giving a score for something specific. So just really quickly on the screen, so this is what the actual output looks like. And see, for each of these areas, you can drop down, and it gives a further explanation and a link to the documentation. So and you know there are some issues. Again, you'll run into things that you, you're going to want to dig deeper, right? Because 
while automation can save us a tremendous amount of time, it's not necessarily the only answer, right? So yeah, sorry, any, any other questions? Hi, um, have you seen any attempts to enforce this at a developer organization level? And, or, or even encourage, uh, find ways to encourage your developers to practice this? Why, yes, I have. <laughs> what does I that have. look like for you? Uh, um, what does that look like? Um, I think like anything else. So here's, oh, well, this is a fun conversation. So there, I think something to think about is insecurity in, in, in general, right? Whether it op it's open source or not. But sometimes the security team is looked at as the bad guy. And I would love for that to not be the case. <laughs> because again, as I can't iterate enough, we are all in this together, right? And so I, I don't know if you've heard the, the term shift left. Uh, you hear it a lot, right, thrown, about, uh, thrown around about open source security. And that just means addressing security earlier on. But what that tends to kind of come out as is kind of pointing fingers at the developer, right? L like l the developer needs to take on a little bit more responsibility. And while I think that that is true to an extent, um, there's also a little bit of, there's a communication that has to, to, to go back and forth, and there's education and all of that. So what I would say about efforts to enforce scorecard um, you're going to have a little bit of pushback sometimes, but I think that's okay, right? It, this is all part of education. Um, what I would love to see is developers to want to have a better score, right? <laughs> Just like anything else in life. I want to have a better score. When I get, when I run my own projects or my own repo through Scorecard, I want to fix all of these things. Now, I have a little bit of an advantage because I know how to fix these things. Um, but, but again, I think it's all about education and it's about really emphasizing the importance of the why that we do all of this. There's a good reason for it, right? You don't want a repo out there um, that's accept merging pull requests without code review. That's a, that's a potentially harmful practice. So um, I think, again, find me after class and we can talk a little bit more about enforce enforcement and, and actually implementing these things. But, but my personal feeling is just that I would love to see a world where security policy is not considered like a <laughs> a necessary evil. I would love to see it embraced more by developers. Right? Developers really, again, wanting, wanting the high score. So, anybody else? Uh, just to actually add to that, uh, the OpenSSF does have another tool, which I don't have too much experience with, so I can't go into too much detail, but it's, it's a tool called AllStar. Yes, that um, is true. Which is, yep. I believe it's basically like a GitHub app or something you can install in your organization, and it'll run scorecard, I believe, on yeah. repositories in your GitHub organization. And uh, then it'll send like issues or something, some sort of notification to the owners of the respective repository saying, hey, um, we in the organization request these particular checks, not necessarily all of them, but and then these are the things that we require, we require and uh, here's how you can fix them sort of thing. Thank you. So I, I pulled this slide back up. Um, again, I, I just touched on a few things here that are specifically related to consuming open source uh, software and dependencies and whatnot. But yeah, there are a ton of different projects. There's so much uh, going on and there's so much activity. I think actually the contributor guide I showed was from AllStar. Um, but yeah, I encur would encourage everybody to look in, dig in, and see if any of these tools or projects are helpful to you. Uh, that's, I mean, that's what they're made for. Uh, yes, another question. The CVE bin tool that you were mentioning, oh, yes. is there any details around false positives and false negatives? Oh, that is an excellent question that I don't know the answer to. Um, I talked to Terry. Oh, yeah, Ryan knows the answer. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so, yeah, I... So that, that is an excellent question, and, and, and uh, I think we've all encountered security tools that give uh, uh, significant numbers of, of false positives and false negatives. Uh, but CVE and bin tool um, extremely rarely will yeah. give a false positive or a false negative. The, the one downside to CVE bin tool is it's only checking for about 290 different projects. Yeah. Uh, um, so it's not going to catch every single project that might end up in your binary. But uh, it, it, it is really good at the things that it does detect. Yeah. Yeah, 290 checkers for sure. Yeah, that, that was my understanding from talking to, with Terry about it is that it's not a huge problem. But again, it doesn't check for everything. And that's another, yet another example where I would, you know, if, if there is something missing in the checks, that's something that, that they would be happy to have contributed, right? 
Yeah, ter Terry's fantastic. Please, please get involved with her project. <laughs> are there are there versions of these tools that way that can run on isolated networks that aren't connected to the internet? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I can I can run. Well, no, that's a hmm, scorecard. It needs to ping the internet to ping the repo, repo itself. CVE bin tool for sure can run I isolated, not connected to the internet. Um, but a lot of the, uh, the OpenSSF stuff is going to require some kind of connection because it's got to ping get GitHub. Well, it does, but exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not gonna. Again, you can't. It's it's not it's it's not gonna be able to check things like code review, right? If it can't ping GitHub. But. Yes. Follow up to the CVE bin tool question is: Is it looking for highs and criticals or full spectrum of severities? It's look, yeah. It's looking at all of them. Um, it 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 flags their existence. I believe it also will output the severity, but I can't remember. Yeah, <laughs> if it has one. But that's a conversation for <laughs> after class too. Uh, yeah. Well, quickly, I do. You know, I think. I, along with a lot of other people you know, working in the security arena, expect CVEs to increase quite a bit this year. If anyone's following the Linux uh, CVE naming authority um, activity, there, there is some issue with, with uh, missing criticality scores. So that's a conversation. Yeah, only at 80 a day. Yeah. So that's a conversation maybe uh, we will have again next year when we see how this year plays out. Uh, any other questions? Any any anything else at all that you would like to talk about? I'm sorry, I didn't get that. So the Open SSS scorecard tool does it run? Did you say 290 project? Oh, or maybe that was for CV. Oh, the Bento is two. So how many? How does the scorecard thing? Do you just go to, how many projects do you have there? So Scorecard, it tracks specific projects regularly on, its, on the web interface, but you can run Scorecard on any, on any repo. It works with GitHub. It also now works with uh, GitLab. Oh, repo. so you run this with yeah, a GitHub yeah, yeah. or GitLab repositories mm -hmm. and to get that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Got yeah, it. you so can run it on a brand new repo even. I mean, you're probably going to get a low score. You don't have a lot of code reviews there, but you so can, yeah, I you can run it on a you can run this in the air gap environment, right? You can. Again, it, okay. it can check certain things, okay. but there are certain things it can't because you, you need, it needs to ping back the, the, you know, the repo. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Does it work against GitHub Enterprise internal? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yep, for sure. And GitLab Enterprise as well. Um, any questions about getting involved in the OpenSSF? I would love, I would love to hear somebody uh, that might be interested in that because that's another thing that I that. Yes. Again, yeah, yeah. We so at, at Intel, I'm very fortunate. I have to quick plug. I'm very fortunate to have the ability to spend a, spend time contributing to these open source organizations and, give, and giving back. And I have a lot of wonderful colleagues like Ryan who also do that and are involved. And you have you know, people from all over, again, companies big and small, and you just find your niche. You find what, you know, what, what are your pain points in, in security-wise, and you get involved. You find there are so many working groups working on so many different things. And um, it, it really is kind of gratifying, number one. And number two, you get to work with really, really smart people that are working on very important problems. Um, again, why, you know, the reason I'm here is because I used to maintain a, an open source project. And every time those CVEs came out, you know, it was a little bit of a panic. And I, I started to realize that maybe I didn't know, yet know enough. I, I thought I knew you know, uh, uh, about security best practices, but I, I wanted to educate myself further. And so, you know, again, I can't, I can't stress enough that getting involved in being part of finding the solutions, not that we necessarily have them yet, because again, security is never done, but being part of finding the solutions is, is really incredibly gratifying and a great learning experience. So yeah, with that, if no more questions, again, um, oh, sorry, yes, one more question. Do you have uh, any sort of online post with all of the links and stuff? There you go, you beat me to it. Apologies for not getting that up earlier, but yeah, oh, please, sweet. yeah, all of these resources. Uh, yes, I promise this is a trustworthy QR code. Oh, come on. 
Um, but yeah, there's a, you can find all of this. Soon there will be a PDF of the whole presentation. There are links to everything, including all of the OpenSSF tools, uh, articles that I cited, all of that. There's some really good stuff in there that uh, was written by some really smart people. And uh, yeah, I encourage you to check that out. And then on the next slide you, is a way to find me if you ever have questions. If you, if you ever have questions to Ryan, I know where to find him. <laughs> if you have questions about the OpenSSF, I would, love, I would love to answer those too because I'd love to see more people get involved. So cool. Well, thanks everyone. I'll give you some time back. Um, I encourage you, you have a few minutes, um, to check out Kyle Rankin's talk in room 105 in the next section. And if you're interested in podcasts, you can follow me over to the other building and I will be talking about podcasts in uh, ballroom C and we will have a lot of fun with that. But thank you again, everyone. Um, thank you for caring about open source security because it's important. <laughs>